ask me how you can progress proceed good evening everyone i am dr sneha from ovum hospital i would like to present about pprom and uh, i'll present two case scenarios here i am presenting first case will be a patient named abc 25 year old she is coming with 8 months of amenorrhea with regular anc booked and immunized has uh, come with history of pv leak since 1 hour prior to admission there is no history of pain abdomen no history of uh, uh, pv bleed she is uh, 32 weeks by dates and scans are corresponding to it no history of diabetes hypertension asthma or epilepsy vitals are normal uh, uterus corresponds to 30 weeks size uh, it's relaxed and fhs is present per speculum examination is os uh, os is closed and there is active leak the leak is clear so uh, we came we have got a patient who is a primary 32 weeks with uh, pprom um, and uh, we have sent Uh, crp total count cbc and uh, her nst was reactive so we have given her uh, steroids and as she was uh, already 32 weeks we have not given her any magnesium sulfates sulfate antibiotics were given <coughs> in ovum we are giving cefuroxime 1.5 g iv and conservative management was done for 2 days the nst showed variable deceleration and as the bishop score was low uh, she was taken up for emergency lscs 1.3 kg female baby was extracted baby cried immediately after birth dcc was done baby had mild respiratory distress and was shifted to <coughs> nicu so uh, how do you define uh, PPROM it is a rupture of membranes before 37 weeks of gestation it uh, complicates around 3% of the pregnancies it uh, is uh, it causes it, uh, it it causes it is a reason for uh, 30 to 40% of all the preterm deliveries the risk factors include history of preterm PROM which is a major risk factor the previous history uh, history of uh, short cervical length uh history of second and third trimester bleeding low body mass index low socio economic status sir hasni ha the other slides are not changing sir Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir, but it is not in uh, play mode. Yeah. Is the slide on risk factors visible now? No, sir. It's on the first slide only. Now, are you able to see? No, sir. is it visible now no so actually i can present but ah uh, now it's visible it's visible is it visible now yes sir yeah can you see the risk factor slide now yes sir okay okay sure not sure why it happened okay uh short cervical length second trimester and third trimester bleeding low body mass index low socio economic status cigarette smoking and illicit drug use so diagnosis is basically by maternal history 
and uh, sterile speculum examination uh, should be done and uh, we should visualize the vaginal vaginal pooling or the the leak coming out from the os if it is not visible and we are not able to conclude the there was leak in the patient then we can go for ph testing normal vaginal ph is around 3.8 to 4.5 in uh, uh, when there is a leak the uh, amniotic fluid uh, is more alkaline so vaginal ph will become alkaline and it will change from uh, 3.8 to around 7 7.3 if no amniotic fluid is seen then we have to look for igf bp1 uh, it's the insulin like growth factor binding protein or uh, placental alpha microglobulin 1 in the vaginal fluid it uh, there also that these are tests like amniosure uh, which will give us uh, a more clear idea whether the patient had any leak fibronectin is sensitive in preterm cases where uh, uh, there is separation between the membranes and the uh, uh, uterine wall role of uh, you can uh, we can also do a count to assess the but uh, the role is unclear then we have to do a high vaginal swab uh, we have to monitor the patient for uh, chorioamnitis we have to look for pulse bp temperature any symptoms which the patient has and also look for the respiratory rate and uh, we have to ask the patient uh, whether she has any lower abdominal pain abnormal vaginal discharge fever malice or she has any reduced movements and we should uh, send c reactive protein and wbc counts which is recommended around twice weekly and uh, we have to monitor the fetal heart rate coming to the antibiotic uh, RCOG says erythromycin should be given for 10 days following the diagnosis of PPRM or until the woman is in established labor. And uh, it reduces the uh, neonatal infection, use of surfactant and oxygen therapy, abnormal uh, cerebral ultrasound prior to discharge, it's reduced. But uh, uh, antibiotic of choice according to RCOG and ACOG, they say erythromycin 250 mg four times a day for 10 days uh, or until the woman is in established labor, whichever is earlier. But uh, antibiotics uh, is a controversy because uh, in uh, uh, other countries, the uh, GBS is more common. In our country, E. coli, Enterococcus, and uh, Coagulase negative, Staphylococcus, Candida are more common. So we have to go uh, according to the local guidelines. Corticosteroids uh, should be if the patient is less than uh, 34 weeks of gestation and uh, we should consider corticosteroids if it is more than 34 to 36 weeks as uh, fetal risks also are uh, there after uh, uh, with corticosteroids and after we give corticosteroids wbc count will rise for uh, 24 hours af uh, after the administration of corticosteroids and it will return to baseline after three days so after giving corticosteroids, we should rely more on the C-reactive protein, which will be more specific. Other treatments like amnio infusion and sealants are under study. Amnio infusion is not recommended. Mode of delivery. If patient uh, is, uh, doesn't go into chorioamnitis or doesn't go into uh, established labor, which will occur in all... Dr. Sneha, just a minute, there's some issue with slides, I think. <coughs> Raman Karehe. Can you see the slides moving now? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, I can. So now we are able to see. Okay, okay. Not sure why technical glitch. Okay.
mode of delivery, we can wait till 37 weeks if labor is not established. Or if uh, almost 50% of the cases, patient goes into active labor um, seven days. Patients include intraamniotic in infection, which is seen in 15 to 35 percent of the cases. Seen in 15 to 25 percent of the cases. Abruptive placenta is seen in 2 to 5 percent. Other complications are retained placenta. There is significant increased mor maternal morbidity, including sepsis, transfusion, and uh, requirement of blood transfusion, hemorrhage, infection, and acute renal injury. Coming to case scenario two, here yeah, I am present. Can you finish the pediatric case one? Yeah, that would be better. We can correlate. Is my screen visible? No, sir. Is my screen visible now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So we have two case scenarios, I think just with the same case. So in summary, whatever Dr. Sneha presented, we have a 32-weeker, 1.3 kg boy, born to a primary mother by preterm vaginal delivery. There is a preterm premature rupture of membranes. We can see PV examination was done once. Mother has received antibiotics. Baby has tachypnea, started on CPAP. Preterm with tachypnea, not always it is early onset neonatal sepsis. We always have a doubt. So in general, I think we have discussed in the past as well, neonatal sepsis is a combination of symptoms with no alternate explanation plus lab evidence. So reality, it is not straightforward. Many times we have symptoms, lab doesn't correlate. Sometimes we have lab evidence, but symptoms will be explained by plain HMD. So the big challenge is the diagnosis of early onset neonatal sepsis in neonates because there are many symptoms which can be explained by non-infectious causes ranging from temperature instability, temperature instability by altered environmental temperature, Respiratory causes in a newborn due to transient tachypnea of newborn. Respiratory distress syndrome, that is HMD, can also present with tachypnea at birth. And of course, other neurological symptoms as well. So the big challenge for a neonatologist seeing a newborn is, is it HMD, TTNB, or congenital pneumonia when you have in the setting of leaking PV for a short duration? So we already know this from the previous session. Screen actually has a good negative predictive value. Although CBC is commonly done, the normal value in the first three days can be 5,000 to 35,000. Simply a count of 20,000 may still be normal for a newborn in the first three days. Low counts is generally more predictive of sepsis. Counts can be raised per se because of birth process or because of asphyxia. MAS or IUGR, you can have a false raise. Similarly, CRP is not sensitive. The sensitivity is only 35% in the first three days. After three days, sensitivity of CRP will increase. Normal babies per se can have CRPs up to 10 to 50. So just a positive CRP may not actually indicate sepsis. Primarily, the screen is helpful. If you have a doubt to rule out sepsis, Positive screen is more like tossing a coin. So don't read positive CRP babies well with no risk factors. So what I would say is that the background is neonatal sepsis is overdiagnosed. Screen has poor sensitivity. They have negative predictive value, meaning a negative screen gives us confidence. Whenever you have doubt of sepsis, then you use screen to rationalize the antibiotics. Coming back to scenario one, we have leaking PV in the mother and the baby is symptomatic at birth. 
So it is straightforward, this two by two table, we have maternal risk factors, baby has symptoms, infection is likely. So I think uh, people who do not believe this can argue saying that primary diagnosis can still be HMD. But remember, congenital pneumonia can also mimic HMD with secondary surfactant deficiency. So you cannot ignore HMD here, you cannot ignore pneumonia here. So we stabilize the newborn with CPAP, decide on surfactant if you need higher PEEP, higher FIO2. So administer first dose of antibiotics, the confusions will always be there. Give the benefit of doubt to the newborn after blood culture. And everybody would agree with me that sepsis screen will not alter the decision of initiation here. It only helps us to stop if baby improves rapidly. So the summary or message from here is that mother has leaking PV, baby is symptomatic, cause could be either HMD or could be pneumonia. Do not forget to start antibiotics after blood culture. So in the index child, we started on CPAP, we gave first dose surfactant, first dose IV antibiotics, the distance settled in six hours. So baby is now off CPAP by tw just 24 hours. What next? So how long to give antibiotics? Was it only HMD? So we'll have four challenges now. Should we stop right away? Should we give till the blood culture report? Should we do a CRP and then decide? Or let's give it for five to seven days because mother had leaking PV. So it's very, there are four options. It's not easy to make a decision. So why, why, why do we have four options? Why are we trying to stop early? So if you look at antibiotic use in preterms, this is the data from the West, which actually says, if you have a VLBW, the yellow lines, or if you have a ELBW baby, the blue lines, you can see that 80% of these babies are started on antibiotics in the first three days, first three days. But if you look at continuation of antibiotics beyond five days, 60% of these VLBW babies, they are stopping antibiotics in 80% of VLBW, 60% of ELBW, meaning if the culture is negative, if they think the cause is due to HMD, they're stopping antibiotics. Why are they trying to stop antibiotics? Because if there is prolonged antibiotic exposure in preterms, that is beyond five days of antibiotics, your risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and death increases. So if you have to reduce NEC, reduce death, so I think we need to have a stop on antibiotics early. So antibiotic overuse in preterms, I think there's been a lot of data coming up over last decade because in NICU, we know it increases cost, risk of NEC, death. In early childhood, it increases risk of infantile colic, poor growth, atopic dermatitis, allergies. Later on, causes functional gastrointestinal disorders, asthma, obesity. And of course, community, it causes a lot of resistance bugs. So antibiotic overuse is a big challenge. You must be wondering, it's very easy to speak, not easy to practice, but the big challenge everybody will have in mind is whether will we be missing a case of early onset sepsis. To miss a single case of EOS, people have seen that we end up treating 66 low-risk babies with prolonged course. The ideal approach is identify and treat high risk while sparing the low risk. So if you look at our own data at Ovum Hospital, so we actually have a good antibiotic stewardship in place. You can see 40% of our babies, they go home without a single dose of antibiotics. 20% of babies, we are able to stop antibiotics within just 48 hours, that is within just two doses. Only 15% of our babies get antibiotics beyond five days. You can see very minimal babies on Miro, Vanco, Colistin. You must be wondering, what about survival? Our survival is good despite lesser use of broad spectrum antibiotics. So people who want to stop early, I think this is a confidence message to you from our data of 2021. So coming back to the index child, so how long to give antibiotics? Stop or give it till blood culture, do sepsis screen or give for five to seven days. I think looking at the previous slides, everybody would agree with me that you can either give it till blood culture or 
do a sepsis screen and then stop it i think no everybody would agree with me not to give for 5 to 7 days so summary is that start antibiotics early in the presence of risk factors in preterm babies have an exit plan if the baby improves rapidly either screen or blood culture both the approaches are equally good depending upon the logistics available in your setup avoid prolonged exposure of antibiotics because we know prolonged exposure is not good identify and treat high risk early exit and low risk so that that's it from me from the first case so i think we can have the questions again let's let's go back to the second case from uh, dr sneha are you able to see the new screen now yes sir this part this yeah case 2 so there is a lag in the screen sir is it visible now this is xyz 32 year old presents with 34 weeks of pregnancy with history of query leak since one week and uh, she gives history of pain abdomen suggestive of labor pain since 4 hours uh, there is no history of pv bleed she is booked and immunized outside uh, primary gravida married uh, since 10 years conceived on ovulation induction and uh, her pulse is 104 beats per minute bp 1170 uterus corresponds to 30 to 32 weeks size and uh, uterus is hugging the fetus like like a appears less on uh, per speculum examination she is 3 cm dilated well faced no veins are absent there is no leak and uh, pv findings correspond uh, the the ps findings are reconfirmed and vagina is hot and dry Uh, her investigations the counts were uh, raised sixteen thousand CRP is ten. Uh, we uh, gave her injection oxytocin and uh, we uh, accelerated her delivery. She gave birth to a one point five kg male baby, which cried immediately after birth, had mild respiratory distress, and was shifted to NICU. uh the antibiotics <coughs> uh what we gave her was uh, we gave her broad spectrum uh, uh third generation uh, cephalosporins and uh, uh, metronidazole after the delivery and uh, here uh, hospital guidelines differ uh, and local guidelines should be followed as the incidence of resistant organisms differ antibiotics are given as per the hospital and maternity guidelines and should be agreed by clinicians and microbiologists i think the message is probably you want to give antibiotics as per hospital guidelines the guidelines and uh, depending on uh, which uh, organism is uh, predominant in that area okay Let, let's see what happened to the new one are you able to see the new screen now yes yes the scenario two is straight forward for us mother is a 34 weeker with chorea amnionitis baby is symptomatic it's likely congenital pneumonia so coming back to our 2 by 2 uh, table i think risk factors are present and baby is symptomatic infection is present so look at the organism profile strangely in the west with very good support or uh, they are able to pick up organisms like this organisms commonly identified in coriamnetis for them is urea plasma urea lyticum 
followed by Mycoplasma hominis, followed by Gibius, E. coli. There are anaerobes, Gardenella vaginalis, bacteroid species, Fusobacterium, and others. So you can see that they have unusual, atypical organisms more common than the usual types what we see in our setup. So we, we do have a collaboration. I think last time we did present that. So we are part of a collaboration of Bangalore NICUs. And we commonly see in early onset sepsis Klebsiella. We rarely grow a typical organism like urea plasma myco and mycoplasma. So let, let's see. Klebsiella is a most common bug is what we see in our setup. So I think as Sneha mentioned, antibiotic choice should actually be based on local antibiogram data. In our unit, we use amikacin single drug. The national antibiotic policy, of course, if you don't have a local policy, you can use ampicillin and gentamicin. And I'm trying to stress again, we need to avoid third generation cephalosporins as resistance is very high and it increases the risk of fungal sepsis in the unit. So as a pediatrician or neonatologist, when we hear the word chorea amenitis, there are certain things which come to our mind or certain specific features that worry us. Chorea amenitis can happen with an intact membrane as well. Conventionally, we believe there must be rupture of membranes, but chorea amenitis can happen, especially with mycoplasma or urea plasma, even with intact membranes. Hematogenous spread is also known with listeria. So in a preterm MSL, we end up giving antibiotics preterm meconium stain liquor. Most of these chorionitis are polymicrobial infection. They're not a single infection. That's the reason most of our OBG colleagues, they actually use broad spectrum antibiotics to cover both aero aerobic and anaerobic organisms. So two thirds of these cultures, they say, have more than two organisms. So if you look at the neonatal outcome of chorioamnuritis, you can see the risk of dying is almost 25%. It's a big number there. Risk of septicemia is 28%. So if you look at the converse, 70% babies may not have features of sepsis, even when mother has frank chorioamnuritis. You can have a risk of pneumonia by 20%. RDS, the HMD, can mimic in 62%. The big worry is, is the chronicity. Grade 3 or grade 4 intraventricular hemorrhage can be seen in one-fourth. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease can happen. And these neonates can also have periventricular leukomalacia, making them at risk of cerebral palsy in future. So choreomyelitis for a neonatologist is more like a nightmare because it increases the risk in short term as well as long run for the neonate. So coming back to the index child, fortunately, this neonate, although it started on CPAP, it required very less FiO2, did not require surfactant. We started first dose IV amikacin. The distress settled in six, six hours. The baby is now off CPAP by 24 hours. How long to give antibiotics? We know the outcomes are not good with chorioamnitis. Can we have the same approach as the previous case with just leaking PV. So I think again, we have a same challenge. Should we stop now because babies are symptomatic? Should we give it till the cultures? Should we do a CRP? Let's give it for five to seven days because chorium lettuce is not good for a newborn. So if you look at the approach of antibiotics, whenever you have chorium lettuce in the mother, don't hesitate, don't think, give the first dose of antibiotics within the first hour. Remember, just one third of these babies can have sepsis. And these one third babies will progress towards chronicity. Two third of these babies will be asymptomatic, will not get affected. If your cultures are sterile, with confidence, stop antibiotics within five to seven days. This is what American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC says from more than a decade. So more than a decade, the practice is if the baby is asymptomatic, Believe the baby, do not believe CRP, stop your antibiotics if your cultures are sterile. So you believe the baby, believe the cultures. If both are sterile or asymptomatic, stop it. 
So in summary, mother with chorionitis start antibiotics for the newborn. Beware of sepsis, pneumonia, IVH in short term, long run. BPD, PVL, CP risk is always there. But you can safely stop antibiotics if baby is asymptomatic and culture is sterile. So I think I'm trying to give a take-home message primarily for pediatric aspect, not for the uh, maternal aspect. So if mother is chorionitis, baby is symptomatic, send blood culture, there's no use of screen, start antibiotics. If mother has only leaking PV, baby is symptomatic, again, don't hesitate. It's a preterm baby, not a term baby. In a preterm, start antibiotics, have an exit plan if the baby improves rapidly. If there are no risk factors at all, pregnancy-induced hypertension, placenta previa, unexplained preterm onset of labor, short cervical length, even though the baby is symptomatic, rule out alternate causes, avoid antibiotics prophylactically because we know prolonged antibiotics are not good for the preterm. If there are persistent symptoms or sickness, then only start antibiotics. Thank you. So, Vandana ma'am, you can take over ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Sneha. Sneha, it was a very good presentation. Sir, there is nothing for you to tell. <laughs> Everything this time, it is very nicely presented with a take-home message. That would be a better option, sir. Now, regarding the antibiotic, that is one uh, thing. Uh, as we discussed earlier, third generation cephalosporins are to be avoided, you are telling, no, sir. So right. you are telling that amicosin is enough for 70% of the babies. What about the 30%? That one baby is precious for that mother. So if we take that into account, if later baby develops infection, for 30% is a big number. So what should we answer the patient? So we should see both, no, sir. Like uh, we can't just start if it is symptomatic, uh, just cannot start only on amicacin. We have to have another which covers even anaerobic and all. So what is your, uh, um, like uh, how to answer this, sir? I mean, the newborn, we start amicacin for our inborns, ma'am. For our hmm. outbounds, we do not follow single dose amicacin. Hmm. Because for our outbounds, we do not have antibiogram data. There we okay. actually start both piptas and amicacin. Okay. For our inborn, we have the confidence. For outborn, since it's a varied population, some may come from medical college, some may come from PHCs. So hmm. some may come from well-managed nursing homes as well. So hmm. we actually start piptas amicacin. And if the baby improves well, then it's a different thing. But if baby is not improving, we hike up, step up the antibiotics. So, piperacillin tazobactam, you are telling it is better than uh, the cef uh, like uh, cefataxim and all, sir. Right, ma'am. Right, right. Whatever we are seeing from Kolar, Hoskote region, if mm. you look at uh, like resistance pattern, cephalosporins mm. are sensitive only in 30% cefataxim for the newborns, ma'am, not for the mothers. Okay. Ampicillin is virtually resistant. So, we use piptas because piptas plus amicacin is covering our 80% of the bugs. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Spurti we have, she has a better picture from entire Bangalore because Anand Lab caters to a large population. Dr. Spurti? Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing such uh, two interesting cases. Both the cases are uh, very well presented. Uh, coming to, um, yeah, Piptas is better in case um, the local uh, antibiotic pattern shows more resistance. Like as uh, I'll always be in discussion with Dr. Abhishek, uh, we'll be sharing a lot of cases like this and any doubts he'll be calling me and any interesting cases I'll be discussing with him. So uh, it is always a nice interaction ever since Anand Lab has been associated with the uh, Ovum Hoskote. Uh, yes, uh, as sir said, Abhikasin is enough if the local antibiotic pattern shows good level sensitivity. And uh, if the resistance pattern is more number of MDRs, then start on PIPTAS, wait for the culture report, and then take a call on changing, escalating or de-escalating the antibiotic. Okay, and um, uh, I had to ask a few questions to uh, case one uh, of uh, obstetrics, whether it was primary gravida, I missed, I couldn't see the slide, so I missed it, I'm sorry. Uh, whether it was primary gravida or multi gravida? This one, primary gravida, is it? Okay. Did you say a uh, previous history of 
ली डॉक्टर स्नेहा स्टेप्टोकोकोलाइंडरोप this uh, uh, enterobacter group okay and uh, anaerobic in uh, neonatal sepsis is not very common and uh, coming to the answer to the question of uh, dr abhishek why we don't isolate urea plasma and mycoplasma because uh, urea plasma and mycoplasma are non cultivable we have to go for uh, pcr test to detect urea plasma and mycoplasma so i uh, i can tell we might have missed urea plasma and mycoplasma cases so other than that all other bacteria are cultivable okay sir and um, um what was the other question uh, ma'am ma'am you ma'am you had dr vandana had some queries regarding the antibiotic choice ma'am Uh, because and third generation choice. cephalosporins uh, have a high risk of necrotizing enterocolitis that was sir's uh, explanation if it is given for more than 5 yes. days so if right. at all we had given a third generation cephalosporin for a chorioamnitis for the mother for a uh, prolonged use we could have given for about 5 days 10 days or something again we are shifting to some other antibiotic so baby will be exposed to so many antibiotics and baby has a chance of uh, developing more resistance to more number of antibiotics correct correct so uh, piperacillin tazobacter is a higher antibiotic than third generation cephalosporin and the antibiotic should be decided based on the local hospital antibiotic pattern yeah we had given for the choriamnitis already third generation cephalosporin to the mother ma'am yes now so the same antibiotic is higher antibiotic piptas is already a higher antibiotic than third generation cephalosporin so can't we continue the same one to the baby ma'am if uh, for the, as sir again said, exposing the baby to the new antibiotic no no uh, uh, the babe i think uh, dr abhishek can answer for this babe uh, we uh, the number of antibiotics which can be used on baby are very restricted so mm. uh, they have to choose whichever is safe for the baby just because mother was given third generation cephalosporin doesn't mean the kid has to be given third generation cephalosporin yeah. the challenge what we face with third generation cephalosporin especially ceftriaxonus Ceftriaxone actually causes jaundice. The bilirubin in the newborn. Yeah, jaundice. Yeah. It causes jaundice. So ceftriaxone we don't use in uh, uh, even in new new units are almost up to three months. Mm-hmm. With regards to cefotaxim units, we use cefotaxim. They primarily have fungal sepsis in their units. So uh, that's why cefotaxim I had one is not question. recommended. Uh, I had one more question. This choreo amniotic case. Uh, was the culture sent? Doctor Sneha. Doctor Sneha. Doctor Sneha was uh, culture sent for choreo amniotic case. Hello. 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 Am I audible? Culture was sent. Culture was sent. It was sterile, ma'am, in the mother. Sir, whenever uh, you know uh, the vaginal, uh, the genital tract can have either aerobic or anaerobic infection. In such cases, I suggest send for a set of aerobic and anaerobic culture. Don't just send aerobic culture because as you you have only listed so many anaerobic bacteria, right, sir? All of them will be missed in aerobic culture. They won't grow. Yes. Bacteroids, Fusobacterium, Prevotella, Peptostreptococcus. All of this will be missing in aerobic culture. All of them will grow only in anaerobic culture. So I suggest 
please uh, send a set of aerobic and anaerobic cultures. Uh, in anaerobic cultures, the specimen has to be directly dropped in the Robertson Cook media, which will be provided by our lab. And uh, you can send a set of aerobic and anaerobic cultures. It will uh, improve the diagnosis. It will help us to identify the bacteria. Dr. Sputi, I want to ask you a tough question for you. The okay. big challenge is we always say antibiotics has to be based on local antibiogram data. Right. So not many people will have antibiogram data because choreomyelitis incidence is quite less fortunately off late. Right. So In such cases, be their antibiotic to choice. What should be their antibiotic choice? So uh, uh, if there is no local policy, you can go, you can local hospital policy, you can refer to the national policy, which you already displayed. Even I have a copy of national antibiotic policy. Uh, and you have to follow that and see whether the patient is improving. If the patient is showing deterioration, then you have to take a call on changing the antibiotic and uh, next other symptomatic treatment. Like what is your experience about uh, maternal cultures? Are they sensitive to ampicillin? Because the national policy says use ampicillin. And most of our uh, colleagues will agree that ampicillin resistance is quite high in our region. Okay. Uh, we had got a set of amniotic fluid samples from one of the uh, gynecology hospitals. I cannot reveal the details. Um, in among the amniotic fluid